I just want to give you a brief introduction to Dr. Coleman. Uh, I've been studying this for a long time and seeing what's happened to our country. And, you know, it's, it's kind of sad in this country that you have to come to a meeting on Saturday morning to get the truth. Uh, you can't turn on the television because you sure don't get the truth there. So uh, we sure appreciate everybody coming out. But in order to do that, I ran across Dr. Coleman's work. And uh, when you've studied this and looked for the truth, and it's, it's a pleasure to find somebody like Dr. Coleman that will bring you to a new level of what the real truth, who's really behind what's going on in this country. None of this is an accident. This is orchestrated. This has been planned and plotted and is moving right along. And if the people, the only thing that you can do is be informed and learn what's going on, who's really behind it. And nobody does that better than Dr. Coleman. Uh, he's an author of three books. Uh, he has a table back here. I recommend that you look through his material. It'll bring you to a new level of information as to what's going on in the country as well as the world. Uh, and this is the only country left that stands between uh, the country as we know it or the world as we know it and the new world order, which will drastically change everybody's lives, as Dr. Coleman will tell you. But the big difference between Dr. Coleman and some of the other speakers is he's been in most of the places that we're talking about. Uh, he's been in Lebanon, Brazil, France, Italy, Spain, England, South Africa, and all over the U.S. And he did this, you know, in his work. Uh, he has first-hand experience with most of the things that are going on here. Uh, he studied five years in the British Museum in London, uh, also in the Kane Museum in Egypt, uh, where he did research on the Black Plague. Uh, and, you know, if you uh, study his work or read his work on AIDS, uh, I think it'll shock most of you. Uh, in his investigation, you know, through the congressional records, and the, the, the congressional records is where most information is in this country. And uh, he would feel very comfortable, you know, in debating the Supreme Court justice on the Constitution at any time, because our Constitution is basically being walked all over at this time. But at this time, I'd like to bring on Dr. Coleman, and uh, let's give a big hand to him, and we appreciate him. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that great welcome. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be among you here this morning. Looking at all these big fellows around the place, I feel a little small in stature, but I would remind you what Wellington told the German General Blucher at Waterloo when he rode up to inspect Wellington's troops. He saw the Scots and the Irish guards on the hillside. He rode through them and he turned to Wellington and said, they're rather small, aren't they? And Wellington said, yes, but they don't run away. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a message of hope, not fear. A message that I hope will galvanize us all into much needed action. The problem is quite simple. Anarchy and chaos prevails in Washington, D.C. because the federal government has seized powers to which it is not entitled to and is passing masses of laws that are 100% unconstitutional. And when you get men setting themselves up as greater than the Constitution of the United States, you get anarchy and eventually tyranny. Now, I'm paranoid. I'm going to admit to you right up front but let me tell you what the real meaning of the word paranoid is. It is a man or a person who has the ability to link events that seemingly are not connected. That is the true meaning of paranoia or being paranoid. Of course, it's been used by our enemies 
the socialists, the Marxists, the liberals, the so-called progressives, to smear us. How many times haven't I heard it said of me, that fellow's paranoid? Yes, I'm glad to admit it, because I have the ability to connect events that are seemingly unconnected. And when you do that, you begin to arrive at the truth. It's taken me 25 years to come to the conclusion that I have come to. And I want to tell you that one of the biggest things I discovered in my work was the existence of a supranational committee composed of 300 men. I came across this quite by accident when I was serving in Africa, in Angola, and I was given a series of documents which were only supposed to be handed in to top-level people. They were what we call uh, above the top level of classification of in intelligence documents. And there I discovered that whilst I thought I was in Africa fighting against the invasion of the communists, I was, in fact, fighting to introduce socialist regimes in the black African countries, and that I was actually working for a committee called the Committee of 300, also known in intelligence circles as the Olympians. I'll stop right there and I want to digress for a moment and tell you the word intelligence has been bandied around a great deal in the, America, in the United States. I've seen people writing this and that and the other intelligence newsletter. They really have no experience whatsoever. In 1986, I wrote a work called Mind Control, Metaphysics, Extremely Low Frequency Radiation and Weather Modifications. And in that work, July the 8th, 1986, I said that the top level intelligence organization in the United States was the National Reconnaissance Office, far bigger than the CIA and any of the other intelligence agencies. And by the way, we have about 10 different ones in the United States. And I even had the audacity to give the address of this organization. Three weeks ago, Mr. Sam Donaldson, the gentleman who wears that beautiful toupee so effectively, <laughs> he came on with the program in prime time and he said, this is one of the biggest scoops that ABC has ever had. And he told about the National Reconnaissance Organization exact same thing that I published eight years earlier. I tell you this to set the stage so that you'll understand I do have some experience and that I know that of which I speak. You know, the American people are somewhat like the Irish. I'm sure you've heard the story of the Irishman who got shipwrecked and after many days he was washed up on an island, and as he staggered along the beach, some people came out of the trees waving spears, and he said to them, is there a government here? And they said, yes. He said, well, then I'm against it. <laughs> Liberty is based on individual freedom. We are individual people. We are not the mass. So disdainfully, referred to by Karl Marx and the socialist writers. We objected to a tax of a penny a pound on tea when King George of the Venetian Party of the North. Now that's probably the first time you've heard that expression. It took me five years of digging in the British Museum of Lond in London, which I consider to be the finest repository of knowledge in the world, to come up with that name. That was what the party of King George was called, and we'll come to the reason for that. But our colonists said, we're not going to pay this penny a pound on tea. Today, we are being driven on our knees by a tyrannical government, which is imposing all sorts of taxes upon us, and worse than that, trampling on and tramping on the Constitution of the United States of America, which is the second greatest document in the world next to the, the Bible. And if we could rebel against the mighty powers of King George III, 
the most potent force in the world at that time, then, ladies and gentlemen, then it is time that we rebelled against a federal government that is trammeling the Constitution underfoot every day of the week. <laughs> King George III of the Venetian Party of the North did more than that. He sent Adam Smith, a servant of the British East India Company, to formulate a policy which he called free trade. And by the means of free trade, Adam Smith, a greatly beloved economist of the Marxist, the socialist, and the liberals, hoped to bring the small manufactories and the industries established by the colonists to their knees. Let me tell you unequivocally that free trade is piracy. There is no such thing as free trade. We have to reject this constant brainwashing to which we are subjected. Free trade began with Adam Smith and the British East India Company. Now, who is the British East India Company? They played a massive role in the history of the United States of America. Only you are not taught this in your schools or in your universities, but you need to know. In my book, The Committee of 300, which took 20 years of research, and incidentally, I was only a little bit behind with Karl Marx. He spent 30 years in the British Museum in London, where he got most of his things from. I point out that the British East India Company was the most powerful trading company in the world. They made their massive monies out of the dope trade. They first grew prime poppies in Kew Gardens in Kensington, London, got the best producing opium poppies. They then shipped them to Benares in India, where they began a massive plantation of poppies, opium producing poppies. They then used their famous tea clippers to transport the poppies in the form of raw opium to China. And by their military force, they imposed an opium policy on China that turned the Chinese nation into a nation of addicts. And they enforced this policy, which was known to the royal family and Lord Gladstone, the prime minister, and every one of the lords and ladies in England. And they made a massive, huge fortune in researching these documents in India House in London, I came across some of the manifests of the old tea clippers and the numbers of kegs of opium they carried and the values. And I totaled up these things and I found to my astonishment that if we took 1970 as an optimum year for profits in General Motors and Ford, in one year, the opium trade with China was three times the profits, of the combined profits of Ford and General Motors in 1970. And this was shared by 300 people. That was the committee that ran the British East India Company. They all had equal voting rights. They could not outvote each other, and of course they were sworn to secrecy. The descendants of the British East India Company today run the United States. And I will hope to prove my thesis as we go along. They also interfered in the development of the United States on every occasion. They armed the Indians. They armed the people against the settlers who were pushing west. They ran the Hudson's Bay Company. They also ran so-called mission stations in China and uh, got these missionaries who were really not missionaries at all to push opium on the Chinese. And I remember conversation with uh, the late Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, Prime Minister of Egypt, President of Egypt, and uh, Mohammed Eichel, one of the top journalists, with Chow Enlai. And Chow Enlai told him, he said, you know, the Americans and the British made China a nation of opium, opium addicts, and now with the Vietnam War, it's our turn. We are going to make the Americans a nation of opium addicts. So you can see the influence, the evil, baleful influence of the British East India Company upon the great nation of the United States of America. They were the ones who financed the war. They put up the money for the British troops to buy the Hessian mercenaries and to fight the colonists. Those brave 3%, let me remind you that only 3% of the people took arms and stood up against the mighty army of King George III. We are 3% here this morning. But that's enough for us to withstand the mighty force of the federal government 
of the United States of America. These 300 men in the Committee of 300 still run the world today with an iron fist. Their wealth is untold, cannot be measured. I know I looked at some of the, the records that I could find in Italy, in Rome. I've done most of my work on location, and this has always been invaluable to me. And I came across the, fam the families in Italy who were called the Fondi, meaning the people who had all the money. They were all members of the Committee of 300, the Lucatis, the Reconatis, the Valpi du Miseratis. These people are so wealthy that they would make Dave and Rockefeller look like a piker. That is how rich they are. And this is the committee that runs the world. Now, in my book, The Committee of 300, I name every one of them. This is not a book that talks about they. It gives you specifics. And I must say, I do the same thing in my new book, Socialism, The Road to Slavery, which was 10 years in researching. On July the 4th, 1789, George Washington told the Congress, it is necessary for us to impose tariffs to protect the manufactories of our colonies. That was the first trade barrier. Now, let us dispose for once and for all with the words that have been implanted on our minds like isolationist and you are for restricted trade and you are against global trade. The United States of America did not grow great on global trade. The United States of America grew great on the hard labor of the people who lived in those days and the wise protection barriers put up by President George Washington because immediately after the war they tried the British to try to down the United States through so-called free trade which is nothing but piracy. Free trade, ladies and gentlemen, is a one-way street which allows other countries to dump their products on our markets to the detriment of our own people. That's what free trade is. It's strictly a one-way street. The trade barriers were increased by Lincoln, Garfield, and McKinley. And all three presidents paid with their lives for that policy. Disraeli was particularly incensed with Lincoln. Disraeli was the British Prime Minister at the time. And he ordered British MI6 to assassinate Lincoln, which is what they did the same way as British MI6 publicly executed President John F. Kennedy at a later time. Our founding fathers and our presidents saw the value of trade barriers. They realized that we, if we wanted to progress, were not to be the dumping ground of the world. And I'm going to leave that subject for now and return to it later. The format that I want to use this morning is the type of questions that are most often asked of me. I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of people across the United States and worldwide. And I've been on many, many radio shows. And these type of questions, we note them. And this is what comes up most of all. Who and what is the Committee of 300? Well, I've dealt with that. I've told you this is a supranational body that knows no boundaries, respects the laws of no countries. The first time that they were publicly announced was by a German socialist by the name of Walter Rathenau. Now, I'll give you some background of Walter Rathenau. He was the financial advisor to the Kaiser of Germany, and he was also the financial advisor to the Rothschilds, the French family Rothschilds. So he must have known what he's talking about. He made an astonishing statement in 1934. He said, there is a committee or 300 men that rule the world. They are known only to each other, and nothing happens without their consent. When former head of state Mikhail Gorbachev visited the United States a few years ago, flanked by George Bush and Quayle, he opened his Gorbachev Foundation in the United States. And he let slip, he said, 
This is being done with approval of the Committee of 300. CNN cameras were on him. They immediately switched. Now, I wrote to CNN, and I said, could I have a transcript of this program, which they said was available. I never got a reply. I followed it up with letter after letter, but nothing ever came of it. The point I'm trying to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that the federal government, the secret upper level parallel government that runs the United States, does not want you to know that you have an upper level parallel government that calls the shots, that dictates what is going to happen to your life and mine. So that's how I found out about the Committee of 300. The next question is, what are their goals? Their goals are a one world government, latterly called the New World Order. The one world government began with King George III. At the time that the colonists were brave enough to take him on, King George was already busy formulating a one world government, and he had lined up at least 50 countries that were willing to come into this future world dictatorship with him. The goals then, very simply stated, are to make the world over into a one world, new world order dictatorship controlled utterly and completely by this committee of 300. How can they possibly carry out their goals? That's the next question that I'm often asked. They do it by dint and by virtue of their fantastic wealth and the fact that they control thousands of the top banking institutions, the political organizations, insurance companies. In fact, one of the giant insurance companies, a man called me and said, do you mean to tell me that they are controlling the Metropolitan of New York? I said, the Metropolitan of New York is peanuts. He said, how can you say that? That's a giant American company. I said, well, compared with the Securenzi de Generali de Venezia, it's peanuts. That's the biggest insurance company in the world. They control in that organization. Everything that happens in the world in the insurance field comes out of Venice. That's why Venice is so important, because in Venice we have the black nobility. Now that has nothing to do with the color of the skin of the people, and I'm going to come back to them as we go along. So the goals are a one world dictatorship of the most brutal kind, and how they carry it out is they have these interface banks, insurance companies, mining conglomerates, every conceivable control in politics, including the Democrat Party, of the United States, which is, of course, since 1980 behind closed doors at a secret caucus in Washington, D.C., the Democrat hierarchy took on the goals of the old Socialist Party USA, i.e., based upon the Communist Manifesto of 1848. If you have a copy of my book, and I'm not pushing it, but in my book, The Committee of 300, I list every one of their huge gigantic corporations, how they interface. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is an eye-opener because it gets right down to the nitty-gritty of your everyday life in the cities and towns across the United States. So they carry out their goals through existing organizations. And also, of course, they have built up some special organizations of their own. When I first started writing in America when I came here in 1969, I revealed the existence of an organization called the Royal Institute for International Affairs, which is located at Chatham House in 10 St. James Square in London. I also revealed the existence of the Club of Rome, the Cini Foundation, the Mont Pelerin Society, the Order of St. John, which was known but not known. And I listed all of these secret societies that run the world as executive arms of the Committee of 300. So it controls the world through all of these. The Royal Institute for International Affairs is the executive arm of this committee which gives instructions to the United States government to this very day. The chain of command is as follows. Every Secretary of State 
that has been appointed since 1919 is appointed by the Royal Institute for International Affairs. That may come as a shock for you. You think you vote and you put a conservative in the White House and then he appoints supposedly or allegedly conservative people to carry out the policies that you wanted him to implement. Surprise, surprise. I ask you to find me a conservative Secretary of State since 1919. And if you search diligently and apply the correct rules, you will come up blank. Every one of the Secretaries of State was chosen in London by the Secretary of State, as was uh, Wilson, the President Wilson, as was Roosevelt, as was James Earl Carter. He was specially chosen because he'd had three mental breakdowns and they felt he would be a good guy to manipulate. Oh, I'm talking facts. I'll tell you the story of that. In my World in Review news magazine, I wrote that James, I'm digressing a bit here, but it's necessary to do that now and then. It's not a sign of a bad speaker, although I don't put any laurels around my own neck, but James Earl Carter was not a known entity in the American scene. I first heard of him through my intelligence contacts particularly my French sources, who were one of the best in the world after MI6, and he told me, your next president's going to be a peanut farmer from Georgia. And I said, how come? He said, right now they're meeting at the Dorchester Hotel in London. And if you get your fanny over there, he said, you'll find that, uh, that there's a lot of goings on you might like to look at. And lo and behold, that's what was happening. The Royal Institute for International Affairs had ordered David Rockefeller to find a candidate who was totally weak, prefer, pre, preferably a little mentally weak. And they put one of the greatest brainwashing specialists in the world, trained by the Tavistock Institute for Human Relations, Dr. Peter Bourne, on the job. And he said, well, it's funny you should say that. One of my patients is a guy from Georgia, James O'Carty, and this guy can't take rejection and he's been to me three times for a nervous breakdown. So they hiked Carter over to London and faded him at the Dorchester Hotel, which is a very ritzy place. And they faded him and wined and dined him. And the next thing we saw, Time, Newswave, every newspaper in the country, James Earl Carter. Now we, in our little magazine, World in Review, we told those of our subscribers, this man is your next president. We also did exactly the same thing with William Jefferson Clinton, because we had the story of the Club of Rome, we knew who Agnelli was, we knew that Agnelli had had a huge love affair with Mrs. Pamela Harriman, and that Mrs. Pamela Harriman was the doyen of the Democrat Party, and Mrs. Harriman had been given the task of finding the next president of the United States, a socialist. And she picked up Clinton and said, you're our boy. But there's one snag. Uh, Clinton went up there brushing his forelock back, said, well, you know, there's one problem. My wife's left me. So Mrs. Harriman was dumbfounded. She said, well, you better give it back in a hurry. And he said, no, she doesn't want to come back to me because of my uh, trice with other women. That's how he put it. My philanderings would have been a better word, but he said trice with other women. So Mrs. Harriman sent for Mrs. Clinton and she duly came to New York and she sat her down and said, look, if you want to be the first lady of, lady of America with all the attendant prestige and power, you better forget about your husband's philanderings and get right back to him. And that is precisely what happened. And when I heard that had happened, I knew this guy was the next president. And we wrote that in our news magazine. And sure enough, a year later, here came marching into the scene William Jefferson Clinton. So the RIA, the Royal Institute for International Affairs, does control everything that happens in the United States. They give their orders to the Morgan Guarantee and Trust Bank on Wall Street. And the chief executive officer of that organization is Dennis Weatherstone. And he duly relays the orders over to the Secretary of State, whoever that happens to be. Uh, and he then relays the orders to the president. There was one exception to this, and that was during the illegal 100% unconstitutional Gulf War. Now, I'm going to use a word, and I apologize to the ladies for this, but I need to tell you this graphically to illustrate the power that the Royal Institute for International Affairs exercises over the affairs of the United States of America. 
when George Bush was hesitating and didn't know whether he should get into the Gulf or not, the Prime Minister of Britain, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, came over to the Committee of, Head of 300's headquarters at the Aspen Institute, Colorado, and this is the phone call that she had with George Bush. She said, George, this is Margaret. Apologies to you, ladies president. Get your ass up here. I've got some orders for you about the Gulf War. And Bush went scurrying up there like a little messenger boy. And the next thing we know, there was this massive outpouring of propaganda to start a war against the nation of Iran, a nation that had never done this country one iota of harm. I use those illustrations in order to give you the extent of the control that is exercised by this Committee of 300. There are many other societies that are operating for the RIIA. The Illuminati, which has been around for many, many years. I've written a work called The Illuminati in America, 1784 to 1994. A lot of people think this is an ancient secret society that's gone away. They think that Adam Weishaupt had a quarrel with the Catholic Church and that's it. Don't you believe it? 13 of the top families in the United States are in the Illuminati today and they have a big say on everything that happens politically in this country. Then we have the Society of Cincinnati, which I don't think many of you will have heard about. That is an ultra, ultra secret society to which every president of the United States is forced to belong, including our so-called conservative presidents. And I point this out to you to show you that it doesn't matter who is in the White House. This committee of 300, through the Royal Institute for International Affairs, through the Council on Foreign Relations, exercise, exercises complete control. But their strongest arm is called the Club of Rome. Now, when I first heard of the Club of Rome in 1969, I immediately began my investigation. And as Ken told you, all of my investigations have been done on location every one of them. The Club of Rome is one of the most insidious, baneful organizations in existence today, which has done intolerable, immeasurable harm to the United States of America. This committee of 300 told a man called Aurelio Pecchi to form this Club of Rome with the main object of bringing down the industries and the agricultural development of the United States. He immediately wrote a paper in which he said there are too many people on the earth and that the United States with its industrial development, its agricultural re development is responsible for this curse of overpopulation. And he picked up the documentation for his work from Lord Bertrand Russell, a senior statesman of the Committee of 300, and Lord Bertrand Russell had written a work called The Impact of Science on Society. And if you can ever secure a copy of that book, which I doubt you'll be able to get, you will see in there that he said, the world is grossly overpopulated and we have to get rid of at least half of the world's population, and it doesn't matter how we do it. So the Club of Rome was instituted and organized to start an attack on the world's population using the United States as the whipping boy. And they came up with a paper called the Zero Growth Post-Industrial Plan for Industry and Agriculture for the United States of America. Three days after that plan was accepted as official United States policy by James Earl Carter, I was able to, through my intelligence people, get a copy of this insidious document. Basically what it said was that the middle class in the United States of America had to be destroyed because in the coming push to a world order, the middle class would be the stumbling block because history had shown that the peasant class in ancient days when they had revolted were just easily crushed crushed there was no resistance but now had grown a new super class of people in the united states called the middle class who had long-term employment 
who had job security, who were well paid, who could afford to buy the products that were made by the United States and didn't need to buy products from China or anywhere else. And the Club of Rome post-industrial zero growth paper said this has got to stop. We have to bring down the middle class of the United States. And the way that we will do this, the way that we will accomplish this task is by crushing their industries. In 1980, based on this report, I wrote a small work, a booklet, called The Death of the United States Steel Industry. And in that, I told of a French aristocrat by the name of Etienne Davignon. And I'm sure there's not a single steel worker in America out of a job who's ever heard of this man's name. But they put this aristocrat onto the job of destroying first the steel industry. In my book in 1980, I said that by 1985, we would have silent blast furnaces. The rolling mills would be stopped. There'd be no more shipbuilding. We'd have thousands of skilled workers who'd pass the skills of their trade down for generations who were forever dispossessed of their jobs. If you go to the Northeast United States today, ladies and gentlemen, and I've just been up in Cleveland where I had a very good radio address I gave there, you will find that what I said in 1980 has unhappily come to pass. In 1970, the United States had 5,000 ships built by good United States know-how using good United States steel, 5,000 ships sailing the high seas. Last year, we had exactly 270 such ships and at least 50,000 steel workers permanently out of a job, jobs that will never come back. What happened? Did we suddenly lose our marbles? Did we suddenly lose that great American know-how of getting things done? Did we lack finances? Did we run out of money? No, none of those things happened. What happened was this dastardly Club of Rome had sent their emissaries to the United States to deliberately destroy our steel plants. And they did it by opening the doors of so-called free trade and everybody who signed the NAFTA treaty and everybody who signs the GATT treaty when it passes is a traitor and a seditionist. <laughs> our mighty steel industry is destroyed. Our ship yards are silent. Our skilled workers are permanently without a job. And if you don't believe me, get the report of the Club of Rome. You know, when I came out in 1969, with my report on the Club of Rome, nobody had ever heard of it. And people, when they got it, said, well, this guy's paranoid. There's no such organization. It's probably something to do with the Catholic Church. Well, surprise, surprise, 25 years later, last year, the Club of Rome celebrated its self anniversary, and Alexander King, its chairman, stated, the American people henceforth must get used to the idea that they will never, ever again in their lifetime have full employment. What a scandalous thing that our government is fully cooperating with this organization built up by the Royal Institute for International Affairs to destroy the middle class of the United States and to add to the policies of global genocide. And that brings me to the next question. What is the Global 2000? Once again, when I heard about this policy, it was three days after it had been accepted by the United States government as its official policy. And the Global 2000 was a blueprint for mass genocide produced by the Club of Rome. Basically, what the Global 2000 calls for is the destruction of half of the world's population by the year 2050, hence the title 2000. They built a case based on Bertrand Russell and H.G. Wells' findings that the world was going to be overpopulated, it would be a terrible place to live in. That was picked up by a fellow called J, uh, uh, Robert Strange McNamara, and a stranger individual you're not likely to meet in this world. 
And this miller had a conference of all the leading bankers about 12 years ago, and he said the biggest menace facing the world today is the American middle class and overpopulation. He linked the two together. And he said, by the year 2050, this is the state of the world. All of these unfed, unwashed people, no jobs. He said, do we want to live in a world like that? So the global 2000 was a genocidal plan to take care of of the people of the United States who don't have any jobs and who, like Alexander King said, are never going to get their jobs back, and the masses of people in other nations. That is why we had the sudden appearance of AIDS. When I was in the service, I was told there's a CAB experiment, that's chemical and bacteriological warfare experiment, going on in Sierra Leone in Africa. That's a remote corner of Africa, West Africa, just above Liberia. If you look at your map, your atlas, and you'll see where it's located. Why Liberia? Extremely hard country to get to. You have to fly from London. That's the only way you can get there. You land on an island, and then you've got to take a ferry across to the mainland. And of course, all people taking the, the ferry are heavily scrutinized. And I managed to work my way. I was told the Americans were doing the CAB experiment. I managed to work my way to within striking distance of a small mission station. And what I discovered was that these blacks were coming in from the bush to this mission station with broken arms or an ulcer on the leg or something like that. And they were ostensibly being treated there, but they were dead by the evening. What was actually going on was that a laboratory had been set up using Lassa fever virus. Now at that time, Lassa fever was, the one, was one of four viruses that could jump the human animal barrier and it was a deadly virus. They were trying to create a virus that could be mass-produced and it could be sent out through the World Health Organization to get rid of millions of people in the world. But the Lassa fever virus proved uncontrollable. It killed three scientists who were working there. So the orders came from Washington, burned the place to the ground, and that's exactly what they did within a radius of 100 miles. They bottled up some of these viruses they'd been experimenting with and took them back to the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. There they began again, but again they escaped and killed three more scientists. So they incinerated the whole laboratory, sealed it off and incinerated. The same experiments are now going on in Harvard University right now. But they're not using the Lassa fever virus. That has proved to be too tough for them to handle. Instead, the United States government gave millions of dollars to the United States military chemical and bacteriological warfare establishment at Fort Detrick, and they began experimenting with the AIDS virus. I knew about the AIDS three years before the word ever came out in the world, in the United States particularly, because of my field work in Sierra Leone. The British government used their port and down CAB facility. It's easier to get into the Bank of England boss than to get into Port and Down. All the deadliest viruses in the world are being crafted there. In pursuance of the goal, the Global 2000, to decimate the world. Shortly after this experiment had finished at Fort Detrick, the World Health Organization started a massive vaccination campaign. They said, for once and for all, we're going to wipe out the scourge of smallpox. They chose Africa and Brazil, launched a massive vaccination campaign. Immediately, AIDS began to appear. Thousands and thousands of people began dying of a strange new virus, which the World Health Organization then said had come from the bite of a green monkey. They forgot to tell you the green monkey has been there for centuries, and he'd been biting people if he ever did for centuries, but no disease of that nature had ever occurred. The World Health Organization deliberately took this virus, which was crafted from a series of animal viruses, including media vesna, sheep, which destroys the brain, which is why you find AIDS patients get dementia probably first before any of the other AIDS-related complex diseases appear. And they began vaccinating innocent people on a massive scale, and they began dying like flies. Why Africa and why Brazil? Because those two countries had the biggest black population in the world. And I want to tell the black people of the United States of America, do not trust the Democrat Party. Do not trust government. Do not believe that government is your friend. To you, 
they, to them you are dispensable the same way as we are. Millions of people died. I went through Uganda on an inspection tour and I saw whole areas decimated with previously there had been small towns and villages there was not a living soul in sight. And that is going on today. The AIDS epidemic is completely out of hand. It swept the world. It's been swept under the carpet in the United States of America. We were told that this is a disease which is passed by homosexuals. True enough, but that's not the primary cause of it. This is a crafted virus that was spread throughout the world to decimate the population. Coming behind them, and we reported this about two years ago in our World in Review news magazine, is the Vibro-19 cholera virus, a deadly killer. You get this cholera in the morning, if it's not immediately treated with massive doses of expensive antibiotics, you'll be dead in a day and a half. This epidemic swept India, carrying away millions of people. I don't know if you've heard of it in the press, I doubt it. Behind that is a deadly strain of malaria, and some of our forces in Somalia contracted this disease. A strain of malaria which acts almost like the HIV virus. It attacks the human immune system. And behind that, the Black Plague. Now, you've had some experience with Black Plague recently. Uh, experiments were conducted in this area and in California uh, with the Black Plague, distributing them, these plague viruses, to definitive areas by means of enfolded scalar waves using extremely low frequency radiation, which was a warfare technique developed in 1934 by the great Soviet virologist V.A. Gertrude. This is not Buck Rogers stuff, ladies and gentlemen. This is today's deadly truth. So some of the, end of, the, of the Indian reservations were targeted and all of a sudden they began dying of black plague. And then we were told, well, the harvest mouse droppings are responsible. Well, the harvest mouse has been doing his droppings for centuries, but none of them got the Black Plague before that. But, what happened immediately following the so-called population control meeting in Cairo, there was a sudden and violent outbreak of Black Plague in India. And it is still going on and it is not under control. This is all part of the Global 2000 Mass Genocide Plan. I know something about the Black Plague because in my research in the British Museum, I discovered that the black Venetian nobility had never, none of their families or members had ever got the Black Plague. Yet the Black Plague, as you know, swept through Europe and killed half of the population of Europe. But none of their families ever got it. So I began seeking for the answers and I found them in the Cairo Museum. So they, people said, well, how come if these things are true, how are they going to protect themselves? They have, they being the committee of 300, their servants and their families, they have the means of protecting themselves by certain types of uh, herbal compounds mixed with sugar. And they also have, of course, the protection of extremely low frequency radiation where using the technology developed by the great virologist Gertrude, who proved that every living thing on this earth has a vibratory cycle, and he was able to measure the vibratory cycle of various deadly viruses, and by vibrating them double their cycle, you would kill them instantly. So that's one of the defensive weapons that these people have got that will kill the plague if they ever get it. The same technique, of course, will kill cancer cells. But the medical profession run by the Rockefeller family and all the pharmaceutical companies do not want you to know this because when you go in for the doctor, he's going to write you a prescription for a chemical drug. There's no chemical drug benefit out of extremely low frequency radiation vibration. No profit to these people. So that's the Global 2000. Decimate the world's population and particularly hit hard the United States middle class. How are they financing all of this stuff? They're financing it through the Fundi, who I mentioned to you earlier, the Venetian black nobility. Now, why are they called the black nobility? They called that because of the vileness and the evilness of their deeds. These families date back to the 11th centuries, the Locatis, the Reconatis. They were called, and the Guelphs, by the way, I'll come to them, they're particularly interesting. They were called that because of the evilness of their deeds. They made Lucrezia Borgia look like a Sunday school teacher. 
They have so much money, which is the outcome of the drug trade, the years of investing, the years of gaining control of every min mining, mineral, gold, oil, natural resource of the world, that they can afford to finance these things. So the black nobility are the ancient aristocrats of Venice and Genoa, and they called that because of the nature of their deeds. The black girls were one of the worst of them. Now, interesting enough, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, is a Guelph. She's not a Windsor. This was a title that was evolved in 1935 by a father to put researchers off the track. Uh, I like to include myself in that category, although I wasn't doing it then. I was much too young to be doing it, but he didn't like that certain people were getting hot on the track of who this royal family actually was. And so this was put out that they are the House of Windsor. They are not. They're the House of Guelph. And it's important for us to know that because every time there's a financial crisis, it follows a meeting of the Black Guelphs upon the Royal Britannia yacht of the Queen of England, which anchors off the coast of Venice. And all the world bankers meet over there and say, now this is what we're going to do to country X. This is how we're going to control this worldwide situation. And then they go off and give their orders to everybody. So that is the way it is done. I told you earlier that they controlled the United States even in the days of President Lincoln. They had him assassinated on the orders of Disraeli. And they then, of course, in later years, were able to elect one of the worst socialists we've ever had the worst the misfortune to suffer under, Woodrow Wilson. Wilson was elected by a ploy. Of course, they got Teddy Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party running as a supposedly third candidate to siphon votes off so that Wilson could be elected as a socialist president. Now, our eyes have been fixed on Moscow. We've been led down the garden path, ladies and gentlemen. All of the time we've been looking at Moscow, and we've been told what demons they are in Moscow. Rightly so. But all the time this was going on, the Trojan horse of socialism in Washington, D.C. has been stealing our country away from us. And in my book, Socialism, the Road to Slavery, I give you a full and factual description of exactly how this was done. In 1898, the Fabian Society, a socialist organization, said, sent Ramsay MacDonald, Prime Minister of England, to the United States to spy out the land. He came back and he said, there are two things in the way. You have a very strong middle class and you have the Constitution of the United States, both of which have got to be destroyed before we can socialize America. The first step they took was getting a socialist president in office in the form of Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was controlled out of England by Sir William Wiseman, head of the North American desk of MI6. Now, in case you don't know MI6, it is the most powerful and the oldest of all intelligence agencies in the world. They taught the CIA. They taught the Vatican intelligence. They taught the French intelligence. They taught the Mossad. They taught the Cheka. Captain Hill of MI6 went out and set up the Mossad. And Captain Hill went to Russia and helped the Bolsheviks set up their single cell apparatus. Sir William Wiseman was the controller of Wilson through Colonel House. Now, who is Colonel House? He was an unknown person who emerged out of Texas. His father served the Rothschilds during the Civil War, and he emerged out of the war as the only person in Texas who'd made any money. And House was sent to Washington in order to control the first socialist president. And he took his orders from Wiseman, and House lived but a few blocks away from Wilson, and above him, Wiseman had an apartment. And that type of control is not gone. It is still here to this very day right now as I speak to you. Other questions. Give us some examples of what you're talking. How do we know that what you're saying is true? I'll refer you to the great soldier son of the United States of America, General Douglas MacArthur, a great patriot, a great warrior, a great Christian. When Douglas MacArthur was in Korea, he and General Stratomay of the Air Force devised a plan that would have put China out of action for the next 50 years. He submitted this plan to Washington. 
an arch socialist, one of the most vilest creatures who ever walked this earth by the name of Dean Rusk, immediately summoned the President of the United States to a meeting in Blair House. And he said, Mr. President, we have seen the plan submitted by General Douglas MacArthur, and there's no way in the world that you can allow him to implement this plan. And Truman said, why not? He said, you know very well that anything that relates to China has to be cleared by the Royal Institute for International Affairs first. And he said, they don't want you to do this. And MacArthur was not allowed to carry out his plan. And 50,000 sons, beautiful Americans, were slaughtered on the battlefields of Korea needlessly because of orders from the Royal Institute for International Affairs. And that same institute is controlling President William Jefferson Clinton to this day. MacArthur was eventually bowler hatted on the orders of the British government. I mentioned earlier the death of John F. Kennedy. Given the methods that are well known in intelligence circles of how to get rid of bothersome people, it would have been a very simple matter to make it look as though Kennedy had died of a heart attack or some other natural cause. Instead of that, in order to warn every president that would follow in his wake, every powerful person in this country in the know, you do not kick over the traces. You obey us or you will see what will happen to you. Kennedy was publicly and brutally executed in a plan carried out by British MI6 under the control of Sir William Stevenson and his lieutenant, a Canadian citizen by the name of Major Louis Mortimer Bloomfield. Now you won't get that in any of the accounts of the Kennedy assassination. You'll find it in my book, The Committee of 300. You'll also find it in my monographs about the Kennedy assassination. Who are these people? Sir William Stevenson ran American intelligence throughout the Second World War out of the RCA building in New York. He's second in command a Canadian citizen, Major Louis Mortimer Bloomfield, ran Division 5 of the FBI counterintelligence. You want examples of how Britain controls this country? I have given you them. I've also told you that every Secretary of State since 1919 is selected by the Royal Institute for International Affairs on the orders of the Committee of 300. Why is this? We go to these conventions and there's all the hoopla in the world. The balloons are flying, the straw boaters are in the air. Bush has been elected conservative president. Reagan has been elected. What happens in reality? The Secretary of State, who's charged with carrying out the policies, subverts each and every one of them. You show me a Secretary of State that has acted in the best interest of the United States of America since 1919. And I will give you the only money that I've got in the bank, which is about $1,500. You're welcome to it. Because I know that you will not be able to do that. Every Secretary of State has subverted and acted in a treasonable manner towards the people of this great country. And when they haven't done it directly, they've done it through surrogates like Lachlan Curry who ordered the military to jettison a shipment of arms destined for the great Chinese leader, Chiang Kai-shek, to jettison overboard these arms in the Indian Ocean. And that's exactly what they did. We think that we elect our presidents. Ladies and gentlemen, we do not elect our presidents. They are selected for us long before we'd even heard of them. And I've given you two examples this morning of how this is done. The 300 office at Aspen keeps a tight control over every political event that takes place in this country. And it was this office through Margaret Thatcher that ordered President Bush to violate the Constitution of the United States of America and to violate his own personal oath to uphold the laws of the United States by sending our troops 
to the Gulf War against Iraq, a nation that had never done us any harm. And we did it by the dirtiest of dirtiest tricks. We got the daughter of one of the Al Shabaab clan, there are over 400 of these people, and they are, these are the most degenerate, disgusting people that you'd ever come across. The ruler has 140 wives. He doesn't have them all at the same time. When he gets tired of one, he says, I divorce thee, I divorce thee three times, and she's gone. And the Iraqi troops came in there, and they turned it over to the Red Cross in Geneva. 140 marriage certificates. This is the man that your sons and your daughters are propping up today in Kuwait in a most illegal manner in violation of the Constitution of the United States of America. And Bush did a Texas two-step around the Constitution. He did not get the mandatory declaration of war. I'm not a lawyer, but I've studied the annals of Congress, the Congressional Globes, and the Congressional Records for 25 years. And in those pages will be found more wisdom, more in-depth information about the Constitution than you'll ever get from any law school. Anyway, most of the law schools have professors far to the left of Marx, and they don't know anything much about the Constitution. I talked to a few people, one lawyer in Congress, I said, what do you know about the, Cong the Constitution? Well, I got one semester of law when I was at law school, on the, and in that was something about the Constitution. Our Constitution is not even taught in the United States school system. Isn't that an utter shame and a resounding disgrace? Bush said the troops. <laughs> Bush did not get a constitutional declaration of war. This is a very d difficult area of the Constitution. It's a mo probably one of the most complex areas of the Constitution. It's a five-step process that involves both houses making separate declarations, <clears throat> then joint declarations, then the army has to be informed, and then the public has to be informed, and then we have to be told whether this is a, a private war or a public war, i.e. whether all the armed forces are going to be employed or only one branch. In so-called police actions, the president has 45 days to use only one branch of the service. Bush violated his oath of office by going to the United Nations to which we do not belong, and getting them to give him a so-called color so that he could send our troops to the Gulf. Our troops to this day are in the Gulf illegally in violation of the Constitution of America, and we're still paying for it. The story that the Gulf states put up all the money, you go and ask the General Accounting Office, as I did, how much money have they paid? We are still paying for the Gulf War, and now we've got another huge bill to meet, billions of dollars for Clinton's fantasies to go out there and support this disgusting al Sabah clan. I don't know if you know the story of Kuwait, it's really a horrendous one. I don't want to get into that too much, but that land was stolen from the Iraqi people by the British imperialists. They came in and drew a line through the sand right through the middle of the most important oil fields that had just been discovered, the Romalia oil fields. They thenceforth this is going to be called Kuwait. And they brought up these tame sheikhs from Bahrain and put them in as the rulers. And since then, they've been stealing the oil off Iran, and the proceeds go to the British banks in the city of London for the Committee of 300. They're just doing the same thing now in South Africa with the gold. That's part of their tactics, to gain control of all natural resources through the world. I also touched briefly on Giovanni Agnelli and Mrs. Clinton, and how she had left her husband, and Pamela Harriman. Pamela Harriman, for her duties, in getting Clinton elected was given a plum job as ambassador for the United States to France. And this is what happens to the traitors. Patriots are punished and traitors, traitors are rewarded. Dennis de Concini, who voted for the giveaway of our property in Panama and who voted for the crime bill and every other obscenity that is passed by the federal government in violation of the Constitution. He's now going to get a plum ambassadorship when he retires on top of his huge pension of something like 200000 a year. I've been asked whether Clinton will stay the full term. Yes, he will. Clinton will stay the full term because he's been given a job to do, and that is to pass certain far-reaching socialist measures. And he's been very successful in doing that with the help of so-called Republicans. I personally am not in favor of political parties. 
I'm like George Washington. He said, political parties are baneful, and in the long run they are harmful. What happened in NAFTA? A so-called conservative, Mr. Newt Gingrich, who I wouldn't trust as far as I could throw him, went out and acted as the floor manager, as the party whip in true parliamentary style, and he whipped up 132 Republicans, so-called, to support NAFTA. And no doubt he will do the same thing with this dreadful GATT treaty, which is coming up in a vote in the lame duck session. So he's going to run, and I'll let you into some information which I just got a few days ago from French intelligence. Clinton would not be able to run on his record or anything that he's done or anything meritorious. So what he's done, he sent emissaries, and this is the first time you're going to hear this. You might hear it in 1996, but this is the first time you're going to hear this now. He has sent emissaries to Iran to dig and dig and promise huge sums of money to any of the Iranians who will come up with the actual documentation of the scandal where our prisoners were kept there until Reagan was elected the president. And if he can come up with this documentation, he's going to keep them. In 1996, he's going to come out and say to America, I have here documentary proof of how bad your Republicans are, President Bush and Reagan. Look what they did. And on the strength of that, he hopes to run in 1996. That's what he's doing now. He's taking the money that he's not entitled to, and he's using it to bribe the Iranians to come up with these documents. I don't know that they will, because uh, I think they like him even less than I do, and that's saying a lot. What is the Clinton agenda? Clinton has been instructed to socialize America, and let me tell you that the enemy in Washington is more to be feared than the enemy in Moscow. I've said this for years. What does socialism do? It forces changes upon people that they do not want and do not ask for. And we've seen how dangerous that is when we look at the programs that were supposedly programs invented by the United States government and by the president. A man called Stuart Chase, an arch Fabian socialist, wrote a book called A New Deal. Frances Perkins, who was the first female socialist cabinet minister appointed in the United States in the Roosevelt administration. She got hold of a copy of this book and she ran to Roosevelt and said, look, this would be a marvelous program for you. So in the 1932 Democrat Congress, and by the way, don't call them the Democratic Party because they are not. We are a confederated republic. We are a constitutional republic. In a confederated constitutional republic, you cannot have a democratic party. You can have a democrat party, and that's what we should start calling them. But she ran up, and Roosevelt was so enamored with this deal that in 1932 they hastily changed their platform, and he came out and announced his new deal, which is a verbatim, word-for-word -word program taken from Stuart Chase's book, Socialism a new deal. Then when Kennedy came along, he adopted as a wonderful new program called The New Frontier. That just happened to be a book written by Henry Wallace, another Fabian socialist writer. Word for word, The New Frontier was co-opted as Kennedy's program. Then when Johnson came along, he came out and started talking about the Great Society. Now, what was the Great Society program? It was another Fabian socialist book written by another fellow called Graham Wallace. No relation to the first Wallace. Names spelled differently. So here we have three presidents of the United States following an outright course of socializing the United States of America. And of course, every president, including Reagan and Bush, has continued along those lines. And what do we have? Our social security. That was called the Beveridge Plan. In 1942, when Britain had its back to the wall, was losing hands down to the German armies in France. They needed something to buck up the population. So, so William Beveridge came along with his plan. He said, we're going to abolish poverty in Great Britain. 
and they've started this beverage plan, which is the basis of our socialist social security plan. Note I said socialist social security plan. That's how we got it. It was co-opted directly from the beverage plan, very eagerly embraced by Roosevelt. Socialism is a failure. Lenin was one asked, once once asked, what is socialism? And he said, socialism, he said, no, he was, sorry, I got the story wrong. He was asked, what is communism? And he said, communism is socialism in a hurry. And we have creeping socialism in this country today, which has nowhere to go but to communism in the new world order, one world government. That is the direction that William Jefferson Clinton is pushing this country as hard as he can go. And GATT is an in integral part of that. The socialist policies of England failed miserably. They got the great Professor Harold Lasky of the London School of Economics. I once was asked to give a talk there, and it was me against 600 hostile left-wing students. And I had a pretty torrid time of it to start with, but in the end I did get a very good hearing from them. But that same Professor Lasky was sent to the United States to see how the Constitution could be got around. And he said, there's one good way we have to do it. We have to break down these, this provision that said there's no transfer of powers between the three branches. And we have that happening every day. We have Clinton calling himself the Commander-in-Chief, which he's not. I sent the facts to Colonel Oliver North the other day, in which I explained in detail what the Constitution has to say about the Commander-in-Chief. I hope he was able to use it. He said that Clinton is not the Commander-in-Chief, but he was saying it for the wrong reasons, for personal reasons. The Constitutional is, is perfectly clear on this. It says that the President shall not be the Commander-in-Chief in until such times as, to, as called into actual service by the Congress. And in my studies, I came across this proviso that that could only happen after a careful five-step declaration of war mandated by the Constitution. And that is the sum and substance of the President's war-making powers. Unfortunately for us, during the time of the Civil War, Lincoln got the Congress to give him the power of habeas corpus, which is a privilege, by the way, not a right. And he was able to do things that were monstrous, which would never have been done. Why Clinton is telling everybody he's the commander-in-chief, it's not out of ignorance, as I pointed out to Colonel North in my facts. It's a deliberate, carefully crafted plan to get the people of the United States used to the idea that he is actually the commander-in-chief. And I tell you, he is not. The Constitution says he is not, and I can give you a chapter and verse. Because should there a time come when he wants to take some drastic kind of action, he can then get Congress controlled by the Democrats, even a lame duck Congress, to give him the power of suspension of habeas corpus and can say, as Commander-in-Chief of the United States Armed Forces, I hereby order X, Y, Z to happen. It is a deadly danger, and we are fast asleep. I tried to alert Colonel North to exactly what's going on about the so-called Commander-in-Chief, and I only hope that he will put it to good use, because I do not have the same forum that he does. Anyway, socialism is a total failure. When it began to sink in England, they sent John Maynard Keynes, or Keynes. He said Keynes was a better word because it, arrived with, it rhymed with brains. And this is the man who did in the economy of every Western country. And he came to the United States, and by his charm and good looks, he was a tall, well-spoken English gentleman, immaculately suited, connoisseur of wines and cheeses. And it was said of him that there was not a single lady who could resist his amorous advances. He was able to charm Roosevelt into giving the British government $3 billion to prop up, prop up their socialist programs. That wasn't enough. They then sent Harold Lasky and John Maynard Keynes for a second handout. This time they got $7 billion. And when Roosevelt was asked about this, he said, let's forget all of those silly little dollar signs. And the same thing is happening today in the field of foreign endeavor. We find a president giving away 
billions of dollars in foreign aid, which he is not entitled to do. I have searched the congressional records, the congressional globes, the annals of Congress, to find out if there is an empowerment for the federal government, our Congress, to dish out billions of dollars every year like a Santa Claus to foreign nations. And I could not find it anywhere. And where the Constitution is silent on a provision, it means it is a prohibition of that provision. What I did find was that when President Monroe was trying to get us involved in Latin America, he tried to get some money sent down there. And the Congress stood on its hind legs and said, this is a matter that's out of your purview. This is a matter for the Congress, and we deny you foreign aid because it's not constitutional. And that is what set Monroe at variance with the Congress. If you know his history, he spent his entire life fighting the Congress over that issue. Nothing has changed. The, con the Constitution of the United States is immutable. I violently disagree with Justice Ginsburg, who says the Constitution is flexible. The Constitution is not flexible. Our founding fathers meant it to be an immutable document that would stand the test of the ages of time and foil people like William Jefferson Clinton and Roosevelt and every other dictator that is going to follow unless we stand up and take our back our state's rights. <laughs> what is the political future of the United States? I told you that we are being forced into a one world government, new world order. By the use of the word democracy and by the use of the word global trade and free trade. There is no such thing as free trade. The United States made itself great by its own manufacturing abilities. We had our people fully employed. We had our people who could buy all the products that we made. We did not need global trade. If people wanted the privilege of selling on our markets, they had to pay customs tariffs. And did you know that up to 1913, all the money that it took to run the United States came from customs tariffs. We had no income tax. And in 1913, we had a surplus of $5 billion after all our bills were paid. Now comes Socialist Wilson, and the first thing he does, he calls for a joint session of Congress, and he said, we've got to stop this isolationist. Ladies and gentlemen, this word isolation is a smear word. It's intended to deceive you. We do not need global trade. We need full employment. We need our people back in full paying jobs. We need our industries revitalized. We have today 40 million unemployed Americans and Alexander King has stated the policy of the Club of Rome followed slavishly by William Jefferson Clinton. Americans can forget about full employment in the future forever. 40 million, those are the real figures. We have 25 million people un underemployed, people with great skills who are acting as doormen in hotels, flipping hamburgers, for God's sake. These people, and they talk, Mr. whatever his name is, Reich or whatever it is, he says, oh, the Clinton administration has created uh, 2 million new jobs. Well, I don't like to pick on his size, but I think it's gone to his head, if you get the drift of my meaning. There's no two million jobs of any magnitude being created. He's talking about makeshift jobs. We have the biggest underpaid, underemployment class in the world today, and we have the middle class totally destroyed by the Socialist Administration, and Clinton is hand in glove with him and going along with him as fast as he can go. We have become the dumping ground for the world's products, and that has put our people out of jobs reduced our standard of living, the object of the exercise being that one day we shall be no better than a third world country as far as our standard of living. Take the shoe industry. In 1950, only 4% of shoes sold in America were imported shoes. Every president that came along knocked down the tariffs against shoes, imported shoes. Today you have China, Taiwan, Malaysia. 84% of shoes sold in America come from those countries, which means a total unemployment in the shoe industry of this country of over 250,000 people. 
Isn't that a scandal and a disgrace? That we open our doors and allow these people who we subsidize with foreign aid to come back and dump their products and put our people out of work. In future, historians are going to say, this was the maddest nation on earth to allow this insidious war to be waged against them. And that's what it is, ladies and gentlemen. This is a war to the death for the United States of America. The only thing that is making it unrecognizable as a war, there are no big drums being beaten. There are no flags waving. But we are being insidiously destroyed in a trade war. And GATT is a coup de grace to kill off the American middle class for once and for all. And while in passing to GATT, did you know that one of the provisions, I've read the 26,000 pages of this GATT document, and I want to tell you, I don't believe a single one of our senators or our members of the House have read this document. One of the provisions that I found out is at birth, once GATT is in control, every child in born in the United States will have to have an IRS number. Another thing that I found, the GATT financiers, and this is a massive bureaucracy, are going to come in and they are going to limit the type of dividends that you can earn on your investments from bonds. What happened? Immediately this news broke. The gnomes of the bond market took their money and they fled to Basel, Switzerland, and they put all their money in the Bank of International Settlements in gold, Swiss francs. And that's why you have the attack on the dollar going on today. This is a war to the death against the people of the United States. The Committee of 300 wants to reduce us through socialism into a nation no better than the third world countries. Look at this insidious GATT treaty. Do you know that the United States, the mighty United States, has one vote? the same as Kenya or Haiti. And we are going to pay seven-tenths of the huge bill. And this organization is going to supplant the laws of this country. One of the provisions of the WTO is that their board will be able to go in and demand of individual states that they change their laws and take us to the courts if we don't do it. Where is the president who said he would uphold and protect the individual states and their rights to a republican form of government? This GATT treaty is one of the most insidious, unbelievable attacks on the United States that I've ever come across. Let me tell you that if, they, if the Russians were to drop a couple of nuclear bombs on Washington, and that might be such a bad thing. Let me tell you that they could never hope to do the damage that GATT is going to do. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to marshal every one of your resources. This GATT treaty has got to be fully debated. Once before, twice before, we were forced by the One World Government New World Order into far-reaching situations that affected the national life and the character of our people. Without a national debate, the first one was the so-called United Nations question mark treaty. In 1946, this treaty was forced through the Senate by an exercise of arbitrary power Arbitrary power is forbidden by the Constitution, yet you have comrade dictator Mitchell, the leader of the Senate, saying he's going to allow about two days to debate GATT, which is 26,000 pages of documents. That is an exercise of arbitrary power. If we had any men of guts in the Senate, so-called conservatives, they would walk out en masse and say, we are not taking part, we are not taking part in this effort to denigrate and destroy the Constitution of the United States of America. And you can imagine what an effect that would have. <laughs> GATT will be allowed to be debated for two days, 26,000 pages, and some of the most insidious things that you've ever seen are in this document, and they all, every one of them, say 
GATT shall override all the laws of the United States. The President and our Senators and our House members are supposed to uphold the law of the United States. If they sign GATT, they're guilty of sedition and treason. Period. That's it. <laughs> this came as a natural out, uh, outflow of the United Nations Treaty. I found there that five senators, listen to this for a disgrace, ladies and gentlemen, five senators actually read this United Nations document. Again, it was 53,000 pages long. Five senators, I and mean, they had three days to read this document, and it was then ran down the people of the United States. I want to tell you that we do not belong to the United Nations. One of the latest, one of the greatest constitutional scholars that was ever my great pleasure to speak with was the late Senator Sam Urban, who told me there's no way under the noonday sun that we could ever have joined in the United Nations. We did not join the United Nations and we do not belong to, to it now. I've written a little work called Is the United States a Member of the United Nations? And you'll find in there I give you a chapter and verse constitutionally why we cannot be. 1965 we had another national calamity without a national debate. The Democrats reformed immigration. Now notice every time some far-reaching thing happens, then the socialists come along with the reform. It's to reform health, which by the way, Lenin said, a national health plan is the arch of socialism. So now you know where Clinton got his national health program from. He took it straight out of the Communist Manifesto of 1848. They were not satisfied with immigration as it was. The bulk of the people came from those who were related to the Jeffersons, the George Washingtons, the Davy Crockett's. They were not satisfied with that. Without a national debate, without asking the people of this country by your leave, the Democrats in 1965 forced through an Immigration Reform Act that totally changed the face of the United States and will totally change us. And one of the architects of that was the same Dean Rusk, the swine who stopped MacArthur from, bang, uh, from bombing the Chinese back to the Stone Age and, of course, Nicholas Katzenbach. I want to give you some statistics. Now, people have accused me, they said, you are a racist. a racist. First of all, the word racist is a very modern smear word. If you look in the dictionaries in 1919 onwards, it did not exist. What they really mean to say is you are a racialist, i.e., a person who is proud of your race. I'm not saying this against any group, any nationality. I want to show you how the socialists, without our permission, without a national agenda, without a national debate, will change the face of the United States. In 1984, the people from traditional immigration stock made up 74% of the total population. By the year 2080, less than 100 years from now, we will make up 39.5% of the population. And it goes on. The Hispanics were 9.4 in 1980. They'll be 15.4. The Asians, 2.4, will be 13.3 of the population. In other words, the traditional Americans of the Davy Crockett, George Washington, the people Monroe said would make a real contribution to America, will be in the distinct minority. And this is thanks to the Democrat Party, who in 1965, without by your leave of the people changed the rules and now they've got us side blindsided by concentrating on illegal immigration. Illegal immigration is nothing. That's a small problem. The legal immigration that was authorized in 1965 without your permission, that's where the big problem lies. These statistics were provided to me by a man called Lee Bouvier, who was one of the leading advisors to the a former, a former INS official. And of course we know that abortion is another way in which the population is being diminished. I have challenged judges all across the country to show me in the United States Constitution, the United States Constitution, where is their provision for abortion? And I've yet to see. Oh, they say in the Fourth Amendment. Don't you believe it? The Fourth Amendment has nothing to do, it doesn't mention the word abortion. And where 
a word is not mentioned in the constitution it is a prohibition of that word there is no such thing as free choice this is a communist doctrine brought to this country by a woman called, called Madame Calante Madame Calante you probably never heard of but she is the inventor the author and the finisher of now and NARL and abortion it's all in my book Socialism, the Road to Slavery. Where do we stand now? I told you that we're in danger because the separation of powers mandated by the Constitution are being broken up every day. You now have the idiocy of Clinton having line item veto. That means if he doesn't like something, he can go and veto just that line that he doesn't like. That is breaking down the separation of powers forbidden by the Constitution. Also meddling in trade. The president had no right to be meddling in any treaty whatsoever. That is strictly for the House according to the Constitution of the United States. And I dealt with the commander in chief situation already. We need to understand the seriousness of the commander in chief. Lincoln said that if we allow this title he said, we are then putting presidents where kings stood. And he said, one of the most hated powers of kings was their ability to make war at their, any whim that came to their mind. And if we do not stop this commander-in-chief nonsense with Clinton, that's where we're going to find ourselves. We are already there with Haiti, and we are already there with our troops being sent to Kuwait. I want to tell you that the cost of the Middle East peace so far to you, the American taxpayers, is $38 billion and the clock is still running. Jordan was given $4 billion to sign this treaty. The other nations have been guaranteed credits and all sorts of things that will bring up the total to $38 billion for this so-called peace accord in the Middle East to come about. Of course it's doomed to failure, but that doesn't matter. In the meantime, it makes the President of the United States look good. We need to understand something. I told you today there's anarchy and chaos in Washington. That is because the United States government is a government of strictly limited empowerment. It cannot just willy-nilly go making bills. For a measure to be introduced into the House, it has to be in consonance with or in pursuance of something already in the Constitution. If it is not, it is unconstitutional. And I've looked at 3,000 bills passed in recent years, and every one of them are unconstitutional because they were new things that some lighter than air incendiary fairy head liberal said, well, I'm going to introduce this into the Congress. I'm going to have this law passed, like Dinah Swinstein's 19 assault rifles banned. There's no thing in the Constitution that would allow her to do that. Specifically, the Tenth Amendment is very, very precise, and I can quote you 54 instances where this is mentioned in the Congressional, the Annals of Congress, the Congressional Records and Globes. The Tenth Amendment is a restriction on the federal government. Our founding fathers were very frightened to give unlimited powers to the federal government. Daniel Webster said we must cage them like a lion, we must not give them unlimited powers. It is a government of limited powers, but particularly the 18 amendments, and just to make sure that the federal government would understand this, in the 18th amendment there's a little title that's very important that says they can only do things that are necessary and proper. And I want to ask you, is rushing our troops off to Kuwait to protect, to protect the income of the decadent Al Sabah family whose money goes to the Royal Institute of International Affairs banks in London, is that necessary and proper for the United States to be doing? We don't get any benefit out of that. No. The 18th Amendment, necessary and proper. The 10th Amendment, the police powers of health, education, and police protection are entirely reserved for the states. And I can quote you 48 court cases from the annals of Congress, from the statements made by the Founding Fathers. Those powers were never surrendered 
to the federal government. Therefore, the federal government has no business interfering in health matters, national health plan, no, bill, no business interfering in crime bills, that's a matter for the states, and no business interfering particularly with the Second Amendment. I was in New York the other day on a radio program, and a very irritated, angry lady said she was a professor of law from, from Columbia. She came in on the program and she said, you don't know what you're talking about. She said, this is not a, it's not a right to bear arms. I, I told her exactly what it was worth. And she said, well, uh, so is, if that's true, then voting is a right. I said, no, voting has never been a right. The only rights and the only civil rights we got are found in the Fifth Amendment. And that's all. Forget the 1868 Act. That was done when the United States, the Southern States, were under occupation. They were an occupied, they were occupied countries. Forget Nicholas Katzenbach's 1964 Civil Rights Act. The only civil rights we've got are those contained in the Fifth Amendment. And health, education, and police powers belong to the states. Mrs. Schweinstein has no right passing a bill <laughs> classifying 19 types of assault weapons. What is an assault weapon anyway? Any gun is an assault weapon. That's what you use guns for. You use it to shoot people or animals or protect yourself. Any gun is an assault weapon. A knife is an assault weapon. You know, now they have this poor almost idiot Brady running around the country. They're using him shamefully to push for gun control. This man doesn't know whether he's Arthur or Martha at the moment. <laughs> this is not an issue of gun control. This is an assault on the Constitution of the United States of America in total. You cannot take one part of the Constitution and attack it and exclude the others. And this is what it is. It is an attack upon the Constitution of the United States of America. We need to understand about GATT. I'd like to go back to that a little bit. Michael Carpenter, the Attorney General of Maine, and 46 other Attorney Generals of the states wrote a letter to Clinton last July and they asked him, please, Mr. President, let us have a national conference of all Attorneys General of the states on this matter. Clinton refused to answer him. Instead, he got his Hollywood lawyer pal, uh, Mickey Cantor, whose only expertise in the world is uh, running around with a Hollywood crowd. He's a Hollywood lawyer. And suddenly, Clinton puts him in charge of trade. Trade wars, GATT, is piracy. It will destroy the livelihood of the people of this nation. What is the situation facing us right now? There's an attack on the dollar. The gnomes of the bond market are fleeing. I've written a work called The Economic Implosion, Year of Crisis, 1995, in which I predict the collapse of our economic system as we know it today in pursuance of the GATT Treaty, one of the things. I know for a fact that this will be an implosion, i.e. our system will collapse on the ground of which it now stands. It's not going to be an explosion that will scatter everything. And we know that uh, GATT will come in and say how much you can get for your interest. They will also put the International Monetary Fund in charge of our finances. And banking in this country will be in the control of five major banks. That will help to control the situation and further destabilize the country. That is the aim and object of all of this. Once a nation is destabilized, it's very easy to deal with it and push it into a socialist new world order, a one world government. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say to you today, the time has come for us to recognize that we are 50 individual nations. We have all the rights of an individual nation. We gave only limited empowerments to the federal government. They have grossly, flagrantly, violated the concord that we have with them. Therefore, we, the masters, have the right to go to Washington 
and tell them, the servants, henceforth this concordat is severed unless we understand from today all of these unconstitutional measures will be rolled back and a new system will come into being. The Federal Reserve Bank, that private enterprise bank, will be put out of business. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is not anarchy. This is the God-given right of each of the 50 nations of which the state of New Mexico is an individual nation. We are the only entity in the entire world that has a legal document that allows us to dissolve the federal government without resorting to violence and bloodshed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you from my own experience that I have seen a rising tide in this country in the last five years. And I say to you today, in my closing remarks, let us catch the wave. My own plan is to form an organization, a foundation, if I can get people with money to back me, where I will teach what I have learned from the Constitution, what I have gleaned from the annals of Congress, the Congressional Globes, and the Congressional to maybe a hundred educators, lawyers, if you will, other people who are interested, teach them what I know, which is enough for them to confound the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, not to mention those fairy heads we have in the House and Senate. They, in turn, will spread across the land teaching others, and they, in turn, will teach others until we have a grassroots movement that is spread across this nation of people who really know, not just to recite the Constitution, but know all of the provisions, the ins and outs, the nuts and bolts, who when somebody like Mitchell says, we're going to give two days for this gap treaty to be debated, a million people will demand and tell him that you, sir, or exercising arbitrary power and you shall not be allowed to do this and quote the Constitution. We could do that with every one of these unconstitutional measures. It is the federal government that is creating anarchy, not we the people. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. disdainfully referred to by Karl Marx and the socialist writers, we objected to a tax of a penny a pound on tea when King George of the Venetian Party of the North. Now that's probably the first time you've heard that expression. It took me five years of digging in the British Museum of Lon in London, which I consider to be the finest repository of knowledge in the world, to come up with that name. That was what the party of King George was called, and we'll come to the reason for that. But our colonists said, we're not going to pay this penny a pound on tea. Today, we are being driven on our knees by a tyrannical government, which is imposing all sorts of taxes upon us, and worse than that, trampling on and tramping on the Constitution of the United States of America, which is the second greatest document in the world next to the, the Bible. And if we could rebel against the mighty powers of King George III, the most potent force in the world at that time, then, ladies and gentlemen, it is time that we rebelled against a federal government that is trammeling the Constitution underfoot every day of the week.
King George III of the Venetian party of the North did more than that. He sent Adam Smith, a servant of the British East India Company, to formulate a policy which he called free trade. And by the means of free trade, Adam Smith, a greatly beloved economist of the Marxist, the socialist, and the liberals, hoped to bring the small manufactories and the industries established by the colonists to their knees. Let me tell you unequivocally that free trade is piracy. There is no such thing as free trade. We have to reject this constant brainwashing to which we are subjected. Free trade began with Adam Smith and the British East India Company. Now, who is the British East India Company? They played a massive role in the history of the United States of America. Only you are not taught this in your schools or in your universities, but you need to know. In my book, The Committee of 300, which took 20 years of research, and incidentally, I was only a little bit behind with Karl Marx. He spent 30 years in the British Museum in London, where he got most of his things from. I point out that the British East India Company was the most powerful trading company in the world. They made their massive monies out of the dope trade. They first grew prime poppies in Kew Gardens in Kensington, London, got the best producing opium poppies. They then shipped them to... I just want to give you a brief introduction to Dr. Coleman. Uh, I've been studying this for a long time and seeing what's happened to our country. And, you know, it's, a, it's kind of sad in this country that you have to come to a meeting on Saturday morning to get the truth. Uh, you can't turn on the television because you sure don't get the truth there. So uh, we sure appreciate everybody coming out. But in order to do that, I ran across Dr. Coleman's work. And uh, when you've studied this and looked for the truth, and it's, it's a pleasure to find somebody like Dr. Coleman that will bring you to a new level of what the real truth, who's really behind what's going on in this country. None of this is an accident. This is orchestrated. This has been planned and plotted and is moving right along. And if the people, the only thing that you can do is be informed and learn what's going on, who's really behind it. And nobody does that better than Dr. Coleman. Uh, he's an author of three books. Uh, he has a table back here. I recommend that you look through his material. It'll bring you to a new level of information as to what's going on in the country as well as the world. Uh, and this is the only country left that stands between uh, the country as we know it, or the world as we know it, and the new world order, which will drastically change everybody's lives, as Dr. Coleman will tell you. But the big difference between Dr. Coleman and some of the other speakers is he's been in most of the places that we're talking about. Uh, he's been in Lebanon, Brazil, France, Italy, Spain, England, South Africa, and all over the U.S. And he did this, you know, in his work. Uh, uh, he has first-hand experience with most of the things that are going on here. Uh, he studied five years in the British Museum in London, uh, also in the Kane Museum in Egypt, uh, where he did research on the Black Plague. Uh, and, you know, if you uh, study his work or read his work on AIDS, uh, I think it'll shock most of you. Uh, in his investigation, you know, through the congressional records, and the, the, the congressional records is where most information is in this country. And uh, he would feel very comfortable, you know, in debating the Supreme Court justice on the Constitution at any time. Because our Constitution is basically being walked all over at this time. But at this time, I'd like to bring on Dr. Coleman, and uh, let's give a big hand to him, and we appreciate him.
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for that great welcome. It's indeed a great pleasure for me to be among you here this morning. Looking at all these big fellows around the place, I feel a little small in stature, but I would remind you what Wellington told the German General Blucher at Waterloo when he rode up to inspect Wellington's troops. He saw the Scotch and the Irish guards on the hillside. He rode through them and he turned to Wellington and he said, they're rather small, aren't they? And Wellington said, yes, but they don't run away. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I bring you a message of hope, not fear. A message that I hope will galvanize us all into much needed action. The problem is quite simple. Anarchy and chaos prevails in Washington, D.C. because the federal government has seized powers to which it is not entitled to and is passing masses of laws that are 100% unconstitutional. And when you get men setting themselves up as greater than the Constitution of the United States, you get anarchy and eventually tyranny. Now, I'm paranoid. I'm going to admit to you right up front but let me tell you what the real meaning of the word paranoid is. It is a man or a person who has the ability to link events that seemingly are not connected. That is the true meaning of paranoia or being paranoid. Of course, it's been used by our enemies, the socialists, the Marxists, the liberals, the so-called progressives to smear us. How many times haven't I heard it said of me, that fellow's paranoid? Yes, I'm glad to admit it, because I have the ability to connect events that are seemingly unconnected. And when you do that, you begin to arrive at the truth. It's taken me 25 years to come to the conclusion that I have come to. and. I want to tell you that one of the biggest things I discovered in my work was the existence of a supranational committee composed of 300 men. I came across this quite by accident when I was serving in Africa in Angola and I was given a series of documents which were only supposed to be handed in to top level people. They were what we call uh, above the top level of classification of intelligence documents and there I discovered that whilst I thought I was in Africa fighting against the invasion of the communists, I was in fact fighting to introduce socialist regimes in the black African countries and that I was actually working for a committee called the Committee of 300, also known in intelligence circles as the Olympians. I'll stop right there and I want to digress for a moment and tell you the word intelligence has been bandied around a great deal in the America in the United States. I've seen people writing this and that and the other intelligence newsletter. They really have no experience whatsoever. In 1986, I wrote a work called Mind Control Metaphysics, Extremely Low Frequency Radiation and Weather Modifications. And in that work, July the 8th, 1986, I said that the top level intelligence organization in the United States was the National Reconnaissance Office, far bigger than the CIA and any of the other intelligence agencies. And by the way, we have about 10 different ones in the United States. And I even had the audacity to give the address of this organization. Three weeks ago, Mr. Sam Donaldson, the gentleman who wears that beautiful toupee so effectively. <laughs> he came on with the program in prime time and he said, this is one of the biggest scoops that ABC has ever had. And he told about the National Reconnaissance Organization. The exact same thing that I published eight years earlier. I tell you this to set the stage so that you'll understand I do have some experience and that I know that of which I speak. 
You know, the American people are somewhat like the Irish. I'm sure you've heard the story of the Irishman who got shipwrecked and after many days he was washed up on an island and as he staggered along the beach some people came out of the trees waving spears and he said to them is there a government here and they said yes he said well then I'm against it <laughs> liberty is based on individual freedom we are individual people we are not the mass so Benares in India where they began a massive plantation of poppies, opium producing poppies. They then used their famous tea clippers to transport the poppies in the form of raw opium to China. And by their military force they imposed an opium policy on China that turned the Chinese nation into a nation of addicts. And they enforced this policy which was known to the royal family and Lord Gladstone, the Prime Minister, and every one of the lords and ladies in England and they made a massive, huge fortune. In researching these documents in India House in London, I came across some of the manifests of the old tea clippers and the numbers of kegs of opium they carried and the values. And I totaled up these things and I found to my astonishment that if we took 1970 as an optimum year for profits in General Motors and Ford, in one year, the opium trade with China was three times the profits of the combined profits of Ford and General Motors in 1970. And this was shared by 300 people. That was the committee that ran the British East India Company. They all had equal voting rights. They could not outvote each other and of course they were sworn to secrecy. The descendants of the British East India Company today run the United States and I will hope to prove my thesis as we go along. They also interfered in the development of the United States on every occasion. They armed the Indians, they armed the people against the settlers who were pushing west. They ran the Hudson's Bay Company. They also ran so-called mission stations in China and uh, got these missionaries who were really not missionaries at all to push opium on the Chinese. And I remember a conversation with uh, the late Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt, Prime Minister of Egypt, President of Egypt, and uh, Mohammed Eichel, one of the top journalists, with Chow En Lai. And Chow En Lai told him, he said, you know, the Americans and the British made China a nation of opium, opium addicts, and now with the Vietnam War, it's our turn. We are going to make the Americans a nation of opium addicts. So you can see the influence, the evil, baleful influence of the British East India Company upon the great nation of the United States of America. They were the ones who financed the war. They put up the money for the British troops to buy the Hessian mercenaries and to fight the colonists. Those brave 3%, let me remind you that only 3% of the people took arms and stood up against the mighty army of King George III. We are 3% here this morning, but that's enough for us to withstand the mighty force of the federal government